Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hope you're all having an amazing day. We have a ridiculous amount of news which has actually emerged today. I originally was not going to be recording, I was supposed to be focused on getting a couple of analysis videos uh, kind of prepared for the weekend. And, uh, of course, some of that does revolve around the next generation consoles and also performance scaling on Zen 2. And I'm also working on a motherboard review as well. But a couple of things I just could not resist talking about, to be honest. So, Aim is doing her own news video and I'm doing this one and then she'll end up probably editing both. But, with that said, I really want to discuss with you um, a couple of topics, including Intel's uh, discrete GPU, but the first thing I will start with uh, concerns the Comet Lake processors, specifically issues regarding their power consumption. This information comes to us via computer base, as during the CES conference, uh, the folks over at computer base were discussing things with motherboard vendors. And according to several folks, the Comet Lake platform is good to go in the fashion of like the motherboards are good and they work, but the processors themselves are sucking up a lot of power. According to Computerbase, I'll read this out verbatim, several motherboard manufacturers revealed that the 10-core part breaks the 300-watt mark at maximum load. Not surprisingly, 9900KS has already exceeded the 250-watt mark excuse me, uh, in scenarios of this kind. This information has nothing to do with TDP, which is rumoured to be 125 watts, up to 4.9 gigahertz turbo clocks for all 20 uh, threads on the flagship makes this value increase significantly in everyday life, depending upon the load. If you recall correctly, one of the earliest rumours for Comet Lake is that it would be built on an entirely new platform, which would have a difference in the socket. And primarily, this was down to the need for additional power delivery, because the additional cores uh, obviously requires power to feed them. So that's why Intel have raised the number of pins to 1,200 pins on the socket. It's primarily down to power delivery. It's not like they need additional pins for, let's say, um, you know, quad-channel memory or something like that. So most of the pins, to my understanding anyway, do go down to the... Um, necessity of power delivery. It's going to be interesting, though, what Intel manages to finally resolve this down to. I don't really think they're going to get it much better than 300 watts, honestly. And given what they're achieving, I mean, the all-core turbo for this thing is like 4.8 gigahertz, so that's all 10 cores, 20 threads running. Uh, that would be 4.8 gigahertz. But obviously, different loads push the CPU in different ways. So if you have something which is like absolutely hammering the CPU with AVX instructions, that is going to behave differently to something that's kind of lighter or doesn't necessarily always hit 100% of the CPU cores. So for example, if you're running, I don't know, uh, um, an export, sorry, a rendering from Blender, it's probably going to behave a lot differently than if you're... Uh, performing a batch operation of uh, processing for images on Adobe Photoshop, and that in turn is also going to be very different to, let's say, if you're running Ashes of Singularity CPU benchmark. But even if you look at the velocity boost, velocity boost for the 9900K is up to 4.9 gigahertz, and the max single core turbo speed is up to 5.3 gigahertz, which is really, really high. And I suspect that if you're overclocking these things, it's going to quickly mount up. Frankly, I'm not someone who necessarily cares as much about power consumption and heat, providing that um, it's not a small form factor build that I'm creating. I know that others feel very differently, and your opinions are definitely very valid there. But I guess because most of the time I'm building like high-end desktops for like work or what have you, it doesn't bother me as much. And to be totally honest, I think some of this is down to the fact that 
Um, I've owned systems in the past, like in the kind of the early 2000s, which weren't exactly the best when it comes to uh, power efficiency and heat. But obviously, the fact of the matter is, Intel are going up against the Ryzen 3000 series. I think it's really going to come down to what optimizations Intel manages to uh, pull into the into the BIOSes and um, also, things like pricing is really going to be of paramount importance. And to be honest, there are some people who just want the clock frequency of 10 cores, 20 threads, just because of their workload. I'm going to be fascinated, though, to see how this performs, the 10900K, uh, running of, let's say, 5 gigahertz all all the cores against the 3900X. I don't think it's going to beat the 3950X. I think it's really going to come down to pricing. Anyway, next topic, and that is Intel XE DG1. Intel are referring to this uh, GPU as a, quote, software development vehicle. Uh, Intel actually shown off some stuff for DG1 during CS 2020, and have stated that DG1 is just a prototype. Now, what's quite interesting is that Linus Tech Tips uh, actually tweeted that Destiny was allegedly hitting 60 FPS at 1080p, so they actually managed to wrangle more information than what a lot of uh, journalists had managed to get out of Intel, because all we saw was it's running Destiny, but we knew nothing regarding the configuration. We still don't know exactly the quality settings, and once again, we don't know the frame rate exactly. Like, 60 FPS, does it mean that it was 61 all of the time, or does it mean that it was going up to, like, 90? We don't know that stuff, unfortunately. But at least Linus and his crew did manage to find out that it was 60 at 1080p. Anyway, getting back to this topic, DG1 apparently is just primarily uh, created to enable um, software developers to basically understand the XE architecture. So rather than needing to have a Ice Lake or Tiger Lake based uh, CPU with an iGPU, you instead can simply plonk on this particular, sorry, plonk in this particular graphics card and you're good to go. From the looks of it, this is basically not an engineering um sample exactly instead it's a I, I guess the best way of describing it would be kind of like a, a development kit that a console manufacturer would create and then they would send it to game studios it's a little bit like that so this is not necessarily indicative of final performance of the hardware and it's not indicative of the aesthetics of the system what we can see is that it's pcie 16 we don't know whether it's times three or times four there's no power connectors meaning that it will adhere to the 75 watt a power consumption of the PCIe power connector. We also know that XE is going to be divided into three groups. There's XE LP, HP, and HPC. The first two are going to be of interest to the majority of us, because HPC is obviously for like data centers, whereas XE HP is high performance, so those are going to be the GPUs which we presume is going to target like 1440p gaming or what have you. In the final piece of news I'd like to discuss with you today, Jim Ryan, who is Sony Interactive Entertainment's president and CEO, has disclosed that some of the best features of the upcoming PlayStation 5 have yet to be officially announced. He says that while, of course, the next generation PlayStation will have higher performance, better graphics, and that type of thing, the, quote, bigger differences have yet to be announced. He also said that each time a new console is released, the processor and graphics improve. Those are enticing, of course, and we need have special appeals as well. We have already confirmed the use of a solid-state drive. Having loading times that are next to nothing is a major change. 3D audio and haptic feedback support the controller are things that, when you try them, you'll be surprised at how big of a change they are. Even just playing the racing game Gran Turismo Sport with the PlayStation 5 controller is a completely different experience. While it runs well on the previous controller, there is no going back after you experience the detailed road surface via haptic control and play using the adaptive triggers. There have actually been a lot of patents which have been discovered for the PlayStation 5. One of them is kind of a deep learning technology, which basically understands how you play a game, and then adapts the AI of the game, like 
for example, how good the opponents are, what's happening in the game world, that type of thing, around your playstyle. So in short, imagine you were playing a game like, oh, I'm just going to use the example of Dark Souls, but let's say that they wanted to have the game respond according to your playstyle, or in a way which would either increase or decrease the difficulty. Because remember, those are two separate things. So, for example, let's say you found a really cheesy tactic to take on an enemy or a boss or whatever, and it was like, okay, well, they're actually just hitting me through this pillar all the time, and I can't get them for this column. Well, maybe it would back away and then just wait for you. So, AI has unlimited patience, so it could just wait there forever and a day, and eventually you would have no choice but to come out from behind the column and then figure another tactic. So that would be one way that this technology could uh, improve games, and furthermore we've seen other patents as well, uh, some of which pertain to a PlayStation Assistant, although of course patents don't necessarily uh, equate to a real product, but we've also seen a lot of stuff for spectation, spectating excuse me, esports games. There are a lot of patents like that, um, and they would, I'm assuming, use some type of virtual reality uh, method where you could literally be like, let's say, in a stadium watching, uh, let's say, people racing Gran Turismo or something like that. These are all enticing and pretty cool ideas, and I'll be curious to see what actually makes it to the console's retail release. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.